Um, okay, so yeah, as I said, that uh, PR times um, on Monday, then um, it will be more like uh, office hours kind of thing. So if you want to come, ask me any questions, then I can help you with that. I'll also have some on Wednesday from one to four. I'll send you the information uh, about that uh, for next week. And tomorrow I'll do a different review session with my other class. So I'll also record that one. And I'll just post a video once once I have it. So um, yeah, there are a couple of things that um, I wanted to do today. The first one um, was back to this projection matrix stuff. Uh, before, like, I, I do a specific example. Uh, because I realized it is not too bad to find it the other way. After I started thinking about it for a while. So if you remember, um, this is what we did on Monday. So if you have the projection matrix onto a vector space, So the way you can find this projection matrix uh, was by di using the diagonalization uh, property because this matrix is symmetric. Um, so the idea was that you could write it as, well, like Q, D, Q transpose, where Q is uh, orthogonal, right? And so if you remember uh, on Monday, that's what I did for for this example of W, the vector space, which was uh, this plane. So that's what, how we ended up finding um, the matrix in this case. Uh, now, I did mention that there was an alternative formula for finding this matrix, which is, in the end, actually kind of, I mean, it's not too bad. So the alternative formula for finding Q uh, sorry, for finding P was that P on a vector is uh, B dot V1 times V1 plus B dot V2 times V2 uh, plus da, 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 B dot VK dot VK, where V1 up to VK form like an orthonormal basis for W. Okay. And I'm about to show you that this kind of is relatively easy as well. So it's a, if you wanted to find this projection matrix, an alternative way would be to use this formula. So let's try to apply it in this case. Um, if you remember uh, from Monday, uh, for our W, for our example last time, Um, an orthonormal basis for W was uh, B1, which was 1, 0, 0, and B2, which was 0, 1 over root of 2, 1 over root of 2. It's an orthonormal basis. Uh, so far, so good. Any questions about this? Let me get this. So, what is PB? 
So here you have to write B as X, Y, Z. So we don't know what B is. So you just write it X, Y, Z. Okay. So what is P, D? If you follow this formula, it would be B dot B1 times B1 plus B dot B2 times B2. And that's all in this case because there's only two vectors in the basis, right? So that would be the formula for the projection uh, in this particular case. And the idea is now just to expand everything out. So this is the dot product. I've been writing everything as column vectors because why not? So this is x, y, z dot v1. v1 is one, zero, zero. Right. And whatever is just be careful with the notation. Here you're doing the dot product. This is going to be a number, and whatever number you get, you multiply by the vector v1. So let me just copy v1 again. V1 is 100. Zero, zero. And then you're going to do the dot product between x, y, z with 1 over root of 2, 1 over, sorry, 0, 1 over root of 2, 1 over root of 2 times the vector v2. Maybe I should do some parentheses in color to distinguish what's happening here. So I'm doing this here. That's the yellow thing. Is that making sense? And now let's just do these odd products. Um, This product, well, the only thing that survived is x. So you get x times one zero zero. And what do you get in this in this product? You get zero from this factor, then y over root of two plus z over root of two. That's what uh, this product gives you. This that product gives you, and then you have to multiply that by zero, one over root of two, one over root of two. Is it making sense? Or is there any questions about this? Uh, so this gives you what? It gives you x zero zero, right? Plus, I mean, the root two. There's a root of two here, and root of two here, so they become one half. So you get zero y plus c over two, y plus c over two, right? <laughs> and then when you add up these two vectors together, you end up that um, so you end up with x y plus c over two y plus c over two. Is that making sense? Let me write it here. So what I'm saying is that the matrix P times x y c is giving you x y plus c over 2, uh, y plus c over 2, right? And I don't know if you remember, like this is kind of the type of problem we did at the very beginning of the semester, where I would tell you, find a matrix who would take a vector and produce this other vector, right? So if you remember how to find those things, from here you can read up the coefficients of the matrix. It has to be, it's just basically the coefficients like they're multiplying each variable. So you, you get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, half, 1, half, 0, 1, half, 1, half. Okay. Is that making sense? Uh, yeah. Can you do this for all projection matrices or like do you have to use the diagram? No, no, you can, it, this formula it works, um, it does work for every projection. Yeah, so it's, okay, so it's just that, um, Actually, in terms of time, it may be there. 
it could be this one, at least for the case matrices we're working with, kind of may feel a little bit faster just because, um, you know, there are not too many vectors involved in the basis. I mean, it is, but yeah, this formula, this works for any orthogonal projection matrix, yeah. Um, there's a generalization of a projection where it's, it's just like any matrix whose square equals a matrix itself, but like ours are always like orthogonal projections, so this formula would work fine. So yeah, you could always find any projection matrix once you have like um, an orthonormal basis for the vector space. Uh, So it's like um yeah so it's it's kind of just useful to you know have both points of view sometimes where like I mean it's, it's very elegant to think that you can find the matrix this way, uh but concretely it's also nice to see that you can also find it this way, um so it's not I mean it's kind of good to keep points both points of view in mind but yeah this one may be uh, maybe for us a little bit faster just because then you only need to find like a a basis for 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 the orthonormal basis for the web factor spreads W and you don't have to find the orthogonal complement or anything of that sort. Um, yeah. Um, I guess the questions that we're gonna see maybe in the exam is gonna be like simple that we could solve it in this way or would it be more complicated we'd have to use it? No, I, well, I think uh, both ways, like, yeah, I think probably this one would be a little bit faster for, because as I said, I won't ask you to, I mean, I won't ask you to find like a projection matrix, which is three by three, because I want people to be able to use either method. And I don't want anyone to multiply three four by four matrices, which is what you would if I gave you something bigger, that's what you would need to do. So um yeah, it's um I think probably this way uh is faster. It, it again it's kind of less elegant or it doesn't, but it's okay. Like for certain properties, if you wanted to prove certain properties about projection matrices, I do think probably this could be more amenable to that. But yeah, if you just like find the actual projection matrix, probably you like are making a safer bet if you just do it this way. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, like again, this formula does work for any projection matrix, uh, regardless of the of the size of the vector space and other things. Any other questions about this? So yeah, I just thought I should bring it up uh, because when I thought about it, I was, no, oh, actually this is not too bad. It's a nice way to find the formula for the projection matrix. Um, let's see. Oh, this could actually be like a cute uh, true for false question. Let's see. Uh, for any Let's see. Let, let me think it with a proof would be too easy to understand. Uh, try it to work it out.
So qualitatively, what is this statement saying with that inequality? What is this is trying to say? Right, exactly. This is kind of like claiming that the shadow of the vector, right? This is kind of like the length of the shadow. Right. Uh, well, this is the shadow vector, and when you see absolute values, you are taking its length, right? So this kind of claim, the, the true-false question is whether the length of the shadow is no bigger, right, than the vector itself. Um, so this is like length of the, sh of the shadow, like in a sense. Uh, length of the original vector, right? So far, is that is that clear? The the, the NFL. And what does uh, like your intuition say? Would that be true or false? Yeah, it kind of looks reasonable, right? Based on our expectations of what a shadow is, right? You would kind of expect the shadow not to be longer than the original vector. So let's try to prove it. I'm just trying to see, <laughs> I didn't think about doing it today. So I didn't think, trying to make sure that the proof doesn't end up getting too crazy. So I think it should be fine. So And it's a good um, opportunity just to practice um, properties of that products and things like, things like that. Remember the one problem of the final will be from this review session and the other problem of the final, another problem of the final will be from tomorrow's review session. So every problem that I do here must be <laughs> well understood. So uh, what was the length? Okay. Verify this inequality. Well, this let's start with the left-hand side. What was the length of any vector? There's like a formula for the length of any vector using the dot product that I wrote a long time ago. And I'm not sure if anyone remembers it. It's the square root of the dot product. Right, it's the square root of the dot product of the vector with this sign. Excellent. So. Oh yeah, I think this won't be too bad. <laughs> okay, so now there was this property, right? Uh, when you have a dot product and you have a matrix somewhere in one of the factors, right? There was this property of what you can do with, uh, with that uh, matrix, right? Uh, so what could you do? Your positive matrices is your dot products. Uh, Right, let's see, but let's see, let's see, let's see, yes. Right, this would be true. Oh, but so you could bring them to the other side. Right, no, but like, let's see, what? No, but this is, oh, sorry, okay, this is called, yeah, yeah. This is called an orthogonal projection matrix, but it's symmetric, it's not orthogonal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, this is, can be a misleading, I mean, that's the actual name, but it can be a confusing name. Right, right, right. <laughs> because I was, oh. This would be too easy other way. I mean, it is called an orthogonal projection because like the shadow, you know, is perpendicular. The complement to the shadow is orthogonal to the shadow, but it is not the matrix. This can be confusing. The matrix is P itself is not orthogonal. I hope I never said that. But it is symmetric. That's why we can diagonalize it. So the, the two properties of this symmetric of this projection matrix is that it is symmetric and then P square equals P. Okay, so if it were orthogonal, uh, we can actually do what you were saying. Um, you know, the P would go away, and then you can just uh, actually would be able to say that the lengths are the same. So, uh, right, so let me just emphasize this uh, P is symmetric. 
but may not be orthogonal. Actually, very few P's would be orthogonal, uh, like, like only like the identity, and try to only the identity and the zero matrix are orthogonal, orthogonal in that set. Use just a projection matrix. That's all we know about it. Right, right, right. It's just, uh, it's just that the type of matrix projections we're doing are always called orthogonal projection matrices. And so this adjective orthogonal is confusing because we're using the name orthogonal for something else. So I would just to not create chaos, I'll just refer to them as projection matrices. But they're strictly speaking, the literature called orthogonal projections. It's not that they become orthogonal matrices. It's just like a, for again, they're just called orthogonal because if you look, you know, the, like the, the, the shadow has a property that the complement is perpendicular to the shadow. So like there's some more orthogonality going on. But yeah, yeah, it's not, it, our projection matrices are basically never orthogonal except the identity matrix and the zero matrix. So yeah, good. Um, so we cannot use why that, but right, we, Let's just think about this. Um, going back to this uh, dot product. So there is a property that you could always use for any matrix, right? That when you have a matrix appearing, one of the factors of the dot product, I told you this is one of the key properties that you can always use, which was what? As transpose. Right, you can move it around. I mean, both factors are the same. So, like, if you want to let's move this to the other fact. So far, so good. Okay, and now this have hasn't used any up to this point. I have not used any properties of this being a projection matrix. This is fine. So far, so good. Now let's start using properties of the projection matrix, right? So the first property that I'm going to use is that it's symmetric, right? Because I don't want to see this transpose here. So this is Is that making sense? How did you get from the, the, the first dot product to the second dot product? Oh, uh, this one? Yeah. Remember, there's this property that uh, I had this property mentioned some time ago that when you had a dot product and there's a matrix in one of the factors, you can always move one of the, the matrix to the second, to the opposite factor, but the price that you pay for moving it is as a transpose. So, like the property that I'm using is that let me write it with a matrix A so that this doesn't look too confusing. There's this property that if you have something like this, then you can move the matrix to the other side as the transpose. The same with two matrices, right? Just you have A and B, then it would go B transpose. I mean, like if you have to make uh, the fact that like there are two matrices is kind of um right. It's, uh, it's this is kind of like an of course there's an, a matrix here, but it's kind of an illusion in the sense that you can just think of this as a new vector. So this is like a vector u, right? So now you have u dot p v, right? And then you are moving the p from the second factor into the first one. Is that is that making sense? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Uh, yeah. It, that can be confusing. Any other questions up to this point? Now, what else do I want to use now? I have P squared here, right? <laughs> but what is P squared for a projection matrix is just P. Does that make sense? So I will just replace this P squared with just P. So.
Oh yeah, yeah. So far so good. <laughs> I think I'm trying again trying to do like a proof that's not too crazy. So I haven't used like you know this so like so all along we have this side this thing right. Um. So let's square both sides of the equation because I'm getting tired of this square root. Like so like this is saying that the length of P V squared is the dot product of P V with V. Okay, yeah, yeah. It wasn't too bad after all, but is that there way you can do this proof that it will be a little bit statistic. So I'm trying to be gentle uh, with the proof. So what was the definition of the dot product of two vectors um, in, in terms of the involving the angle between the vectors? Anyone remembers this? Uh, it's like the magnitude within the other and Right, right. So this would be the length, the definition, the other definition is like, so this is the length of PV times the length of V times the cosine of the angle between them, right? Is that making sense? And we almost had had it, and now we are almost ready to go, right? Because, like, so if you compare these equations, I mean, if the length of PV is zero to begin with, then you don't have to worry about anything. Obviously, zero is going to be less or equal to any number. So I'm not even even going to think about that. So I'm going to divide both sides by the length of PV. So this gives you that the length of PV equals V times the cosine of the angle. Between them, right? And what do we know about the cosine cosine of any angle? I mean, what do we know about the value of the cosine? What's the most it can be? It can be at most one, right? So this is saying because cosine is between. I mean, actually, cosine is between negative one, one and one. But in fact, it's actually telling you that their angle is always acute or whatever uh, between the shadow and this and the and the original vector. The important thing is that the most this can be is one. So this is. No bigger than the length of it. Does that make sense? Any questions? It wasn't too bad, but it's like you see, it's a clever proof because it does involve many properties of the dot product. So you can move the matrices, the matrix around this definition in terms of the cosine. It is like a nice proof because like there are many things involved. So, um, yeah. So it's false, right? No, no, it is true because this is saying that the length. Uh, this is saying that the length of this vector is less or equal than the length of. This is saying that the length of PV is less or equal to the length of V, right? So it is true. Uh, right, I mean, are you, are you okay with the yellow equation? Yeah. So, because, um, so what this is saying is that the length of this shadow, let's call it the length, length of the shadow. Length of the shadow is the length of B times a co the cosine, right? But the cosine is at most one, right? So the cosine can actually, right, when you multiply it by the cosine of an angle, you kind of decrease the number because it's you're multiplying something between negative one and one. So it will become smaller. Is that making sense? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? In fact, I mean, secretly it's also telling you that the angle between the two vectors is acute. Because otherwise you couldn't, I don't know if you have seen this, but if the angle were obtuse, meaning between 90 and 180 degrees, then the dot product would be negative and you cannot have like, uh, I mean, it wouldn't make sense to have a negative number inside the square root. So actually saying that when you, the when the projection takes like the shadow, it creates like, uh, the shadow is always at a, an angle of at most 90 degrees, you know, the angle between the shadow and the original vector is never more than 90 degrees. It's between zero, zero and 90 degrees, which kind of makes sense like pictorially, actually, if you think about the shadows, how they work. 
Yeah. Right. There's this. I mean, okay. Um. Yeah. So there's like the thing is like uh, this Cauchy Schwartz inequality, which I didn't mention, but the book does. It is like a very mathem. Okay. Uh, the Cauchy Schwartz inequality is what you use to prove that you can actually find <laughs> use the dot product to define the angle between two vectors. It's kind of like a chicken or egg. Uh, thing because the, I mean the way I define the the way I, I wrote the dot product was something like this from the beginning. So if you write the dot product like this from the beginning, this makes the like Cauchy Schwartz inequality like absurd, like trivial or true almost by default because the cosine is between negative one and one. If you wanted to do this like formally, like or properly uh, for a mathematician. Um, to satisfy a mathematician's like level levels of rigor or whatever, then you have to go through a long detail discussion of what a dot product should be. Then you prove that thing the like Cauchy Schwartz inequality, and then you say, well, then you can define the dot, the angle between the two vectors using that. So it's kind of like go you go kind of you start in the entirely opposite direction. Okay, so uh, it's just I'm doing this more concretely. So I'm like, I'm going to assume that you understand what the angle between two vectors is. We're not questioning that part of like your visual intuition. So like, uh, but yeah, this is also related to this Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Uh, anyone else? Okay, well, anyways, I thought this is a clever proof to have. Oh, here's another one which is kind of too false. Which uh, I didn't prove like directly in class, but it's useful to to see it. Like again, it's like a short proof, but it's a nice one. So here's a tr another true false. Um, if a is a, if a is a square matrix, then the eigenvalues of a and a transpose are the same. I mean, actually, this is 87 on the, sorry, 82 on the PDF guide. So I can put the number. So, um, what do you say? Is this nice to know? Is this true or false? False. Uh, now you have to give me a counter example. Actually, maybe it's true because of the thing in it. Um, a is <laughs> yeah, this counter example would have taken a little bit of time because it's true. <laughs> so you wouldn't have been able to find one. So, right, okay, okay, okay. So, 
uh, what do we what's the equation that we have to find for the determinant of a is a minus lambda i, right? That's the equation for the eigenvalues of a. What would be the equation for the eigenvalues of a transpose? A here you just put an A transpose instead of A, right? So is there any obvious relation between the two equations? Right, uh, yeah, because you the determinant is the same after taking transposes, right? So Think about it this way. This determinant, determinant of A minus lambda I, right, is the same as the determinant of A minus lambda I transpose, transpose everything, right, because that doesn't change the determinant. But then the, the transpose can be applied to each factor separately. So this is determinant of A transpose. Lambda is just a number, so you don't have to transpose the number, right, like it's the same. And the identity is his own transpose, right? Uh, so he just get determinant of A transpose minus lambda. So this is our like so if lambda is an equivalent of A, this becomes zero, and then this would become zero, vice versa. So the eigenvalues are the same. Is that making sense? Okay, this is a lot better proof to, for you to understand that the previous one which is a little bit more tricky, but this is a nice one. Yeah. And the eigenvectors are not necessarily the same as what's the symmetric. Right, the eigenvectors could be very different, yes. That's a good point. Uh, right, there's no obvious way to relay the eigenvectors yet. In fact, um, you can think of like A to be like think of this one. Think of this matrix. The transpose would be this one, and I believe their eigenvector should be pretty different. Yeah, so this should be. Yeah, no, this should be fine. Yeah, so the eigenvectors can be different. Okay, here in this case, like it's, since it's upper or lower triangular, the eigenvalues are just zero. So zero is the only eigenvalue. So you have to look at the nulls um, you know, this has to be have to do with the null space, and then you, yeah, yeah. So, I think, or if this doesn't work, and uh, just like a random two by two matrix should should do the trick. So yeah, like the eigenvectors, you cannot say too much about the eigenvectors in um in this case. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, this this should work. How about this? Any questions about this or false? How about the following? I think this is also on the PDF. There's some um, just going over. Eighty five. So This is a nice practice problem. So if 
A is invertible. And lambda eigenvalue of A. Uh, then uh, uh, one over lambda is an eigenvalue of A inverse. Uh, what do you think will be the case here? Yeah. True or false? False. And uh, now you have to give me a counter example. <laughs> <laughs> Would be false because if you have uh, zero as an eigenvalue of a, then you can only get. Okay, so that's a good question to start with. Can zero be an eigenvalue, right? Uh, let's just ask that. So. Can zero be an eigenvalue? That's actually a good point to start with. So it may not be clear from what I have said in class. So what would be the remember eigenvalues mean determinant of a minus lambda i equals zero? If you want zero to be an eigenvalue, that would be a, right? There's no lambda i, would have to be zero, right? So and determinant of a being zero means that a is not invertible, right? So a not invariant. In fact, so this is a nice way to actually say that a matrix is not invertible. Oh, sorry, a matrix is invertible if and only if zero is not an eigenvalue, actually. So six, implicitly, this condition actually rules out zero as an eigenvalue. So actually, the question does make sense because then you can take one over lambda if, that, if, if, if that's OK. Sure, I just careful about the. I gave an example and it also makes sense. Yeah, no, it is. It is true. <laughs> well, but you have to be careful. Okay. Yes and no. You have to be careful because this would be the eigenvalues for A, right? Yeah. This would be the equation of the eigenvalues for A inverse, right? But this is not the inverse of the difference, right? Right, you, with inverses, remember that in general, this, or with a minus, it doesn't matter. This is completely different in general from something crazy like this, right? Even for numbers, this wouldn't work, right? Uh, because for numbers, one over A plus one over B, or A plus B inverse is not just like the sum of the inverses. So it's not that you can just like kind of factorize an inverse or apply inverse like so easily like we did with transpose. Transpose can break down things into parts, but it is more, more different, more difficult this way. What do you, other alternatives? I got an idea. I mean, if A is invertible, you can get from, um, from A to I in some raw operations. Uh, yeah, and no, you can, yes, continue. And then using that logic, maybe you can show something about not that. Uh, okay, kind of, but uh, too complicated. Okay. You, someone else was going to say something. Okay. 
Any other ideas before I give some hints? I actually, I can prove this in two different ways. One is is more useful than the other, you'll see why. But we can actually do some work with this from the determinant perspective. So if you start with the determinant perspective, right? Well, uh, since A is invertible, A time, times A inverse is the identity, right? So what I'm going to do is replace the identity here with the A times A inverse, which kind of seems a little bit uh, odd to do. But I mean, why not? And uh, now, now this looks a little bit better because what can you do next? You can factor out an A. You can factor at A, so you can put determinant of A times identity minus lambda A inverse, right? And this is the term, determinant of A times determinant of I minus lambda A inverse, right? Does that make sense? What's the good? That's just at this point. Yes, is that okay? This is not quite what I want, right? Because what I want requires lambda to be multiplying the identity, not multiplying A inverse, right? But what can we do next? I can actually still factorize a minus lambda. This is kind of weird, but let me do it this way. This is determinant of A times determinant of minus lambda times, okay. I mean, let me put it, okay, I'll put it just with a lambda because otherwise it would be too confusing. Let me factorize a, a lambda first. So uh, this would be lambda over I over lambda minus A inverse, right? Is that making sense? Because if you do the multiplication, this is, gives you back what you started with. Lambda times I over lambda goes up, the lambdas go away, and then you get lambda times A inverse. Right, so it's still fine. So far, so good. And now, what can you do in this version? Um, what can you do when you have like a lambda and constant times a matrix in the determinant? It would be like lambda to the power of lambda. Right, like it would be, let's continue somewhere else. So it would be lambda to the to the size of the matrix, right? So this would be so lambda to size of matrix times determinant of A times, right, so I took out this lambda. So now this is lambda inverse I. Uh, again. Sorry? Can you explain that again, please? Uh, yes. Uh, we're here, right? Yeah. Is this making sense? Yeah, that would make sense. So this is a constant times a matrix. Yeah. Remember, you can pull out a constant out of the determinant as a power, as that constant raised to the power of the matrix, uh, raised to the size of the matrix. So like, if, you, if the matrix was three by three, this can come out as lambda cubed. So you have to know that lambda is in the matrix? Well, right, but it's like kind of multiplying every entry of this matrix, right? If you think about this as a, you know, it's kind of like saying, what is the determinant of 3A? Oh, okay. You see what I mean? You're saying the whole inside part of the matrix. Right, all of this is a matrix, okay. yeah, yeah. So it's constant times a matrix that you can take it out. Okay. Is that making sense? Thank you. Any other questions on this point? And now this is almost, but we want, right? The only difference is that A inverse should be first, like given how I wrote things in. But I mean, you can kind of pull the same trick. 
because you don't factorize a minus one. Right, this is still the same. So this is like negative one, and then you take it out as a as a constant. So it's minus one to the time to the size of the matrix times lambda to the size of the matrix times determinant of A times determinant of A inverse minus lambda inverse I. And all of this uh, has to be equal. We, remember, we started with this side. So all of this equals the determinant of A minus lambda I. So this is the same Does that make sense? So what this means is that if this became, becomes zero, right? If this determinant is zero because lambda is an eigenvalue, then essentially the only way this can happen is for this determinant to be zero. So that means that lambda inverse has to be an eigenvalue for A inverse, okay? So from there, you can see that um, So there is a proof that's way better, way faster, and it gives you more information than this one, but it's a Again, uh, in this sense, it's kind of like why the exam is cumulative because here we just use a bunch of properties of the matrix determinant, right? But it's just about, about, about eigenvalues. So that's why you cannot really separate too well like the material on this exam from the previous material, just because sometimes you just end up using stuff from before. And, but still the question is like an eigenvalue question, but using a lot of stuff about determinant that we use uh, recover on the second midterm and things like that. So um, here's a different proof, which is a lot better. Um, but by the way, so this is true. Here's a, a different proof, which is better. And it will, will take me just half of this board. It's so short that I won't even need to erase that. So this is a different proof, another proof. What happens if lambda is an eigenvalue of A? Then that means that AB is lambda B, right? Where B is like an eigenvector for lambda. That's what it means to have like an eigenvalue and eigenvector, right? Is that making sense so far to your questions up to this point? And now what can you do if it's, I don't know how it clear it seems, maybe, yeah. Multiply both sides by A. So right, let's multiply both sides by A inverse. Let me put that in color so that it's clear, but that I just took this equation and multiply it by A inverse. So this becomes the identity. So you just get B on the left hand side. And here you get lambda A inverse B. So if you divide both sides by lambda, you get lambda inverse B equals A inverse B. Right? Is that making sense? And that's precisely what it means to say that lambda inverse is an eigenvalue for A inverse, right? This is the eigenvalue equation for it. For lambda inverse. Uh, and this is a better proof, not only because it's faster, because it also says that you can use the same eigenvector. 
which you didn't get from the rest. So then this says that lambda inverse is like a value of A inverse. With the same eigenvector. Is that okay? Is that okay? Isn't that clever? I know it's so Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see. Here's another true question. If A and B are two matrices, two n by n matrices, um, uh, share. Uh, and common eigenvectors. I'm writing in a kind of weird way, but uh, which form a basis? And then A, B equals B.
mean, most of the problems with the exam will be computational, by the way. It's just bombarding you with a bunch of true false just to like do something slightly more conceptual. But I mean, like I may just have like one or two true false questions on the exam, but it's not that like, the majority will just be compute like concrete matrix compute things. So yes, I thought, oh, this is kind of an interesting thing to do. Uh, because they're kind of short proofs, so they're kind of digestible, but they're kind of clever. So it's like has a good combination of like being short, but not, but it's still requiring some sort of like, um, you know, a eureka moment where you realize, oh yeah, this is, there, there was something here that kind of was worth checking out. So what does it mean that a matrix has like, uh, for an n by n matrix to have n eigenvectors which form a basis of the vector space. Uh, there was a, this actually told you something about the matrix. Yeah. It's full rank. It's full, it is full rank, but it's uh, now in the context of what we have been saying. It's diagonalizable. So actually, uh, right, like the condition for being diagonalizable is for like the n by n matrix to have n linearly independent eigenvectors. Uh, that's the most geometric definition. So this uh, tells you that A and B are diagonalizable. Okay. And so what does it mean? Again, this is where, oh, by the way, remember you can bring a formula sheet on the final, but this is kind of like this basic equation of what it means to be diagonalizable. It means that, um, you can write A as Q D, let's call this D1, Q inverse, and D as Q D2 or D sub A and D sub D. Q inverse. Or Q is the matrix of eigenvectors, right? Since the same they have the same eigenvectors, that's why I can use the same Q in this equation, right? So Q is the same, is the matrix of eigenvectors. The same is the same for both. Uh, since uh, since they have n common eigenvectors. Is that making sense? So. The, the thing about this problem was to realize that this was a coded way, way of saying diagonalizable. And diagonalizable means that you have these e equations, right? And these are like the diagonal matrix matrices, but I mean, a priori, uh, the matrix of eigenvalues could be different. Like we are not, like, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that the eigenvalues need to be the same. So, uh, What is A, B? Well, if you replace that here, you get this. And the thing that happens in this case is that the Q, Q inverse cancel because it gives you the identity. So you just get Q, D, A, D, B, Q inverse. Okay. But what is B, A? I mean, it's almost the same calculation. Because this Q inverse Q will cancel. So you get uh, Q DB um, DA inverse. And so the, it all boils down to observing that for diagonal matrices, it doesn't matter in which order you multiply two diagonal matrices. Uh, 
which hopefully is kind of, kind of plausible, right? Like when there's a diagonal matrix, there's only zero, there's zeros everywhere except for the diagonal. But um, since PA, PB is the same as the PB, PA, PA, the order of the, the, the two products are the same. Yeah. Oh, because what is the A? The A is like a matrix. Like for example, the A would be like the first eigenvalue, the second eigenvalue, right? Up to the n eigenvalue and DB, but then bunch of zeros, right? And DB is the same, but with the corresponding eigenvalues so of B. So the pro the thing like since there are zeros everywhere except the diagonal, multiplying two diagonal matrices is actually literally just multiplying the corresponding entries of the diagonal. So D A D B is like lambda one, lambda one prime, lambda two, lambda two prime, blah 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 blah, blah up to lambda n, lambda n prime. Because there being zeros everywhere else, like it's kind of like if the every entry is independent of one another. So when you do the matrix multiplication, it's kind of like multiplying the corresponding diagonal of entries, if that makes sense. So then that makes the, the main reason why uh, this works. Is that okay? Okay, so um yeah, as I mentioned earlier, tomorrow I'll have a different re another review session with my other class. I'll do different problems. Uh, I still have to do an example, which I realized I never did in class, of like, say, a three by three matrix with an eigenvalue that's repeated and still diagonalizable. So that you see that the condition that matters for being diagonalizable is having like n different eigenvectors. It doesn't matter if the eigenvalues are repeated, that can happen or not. I'll do one of those examples tomorrow in the other class. I'll record it just in case. And I'll do some more questions of the PDF. But still, so on Monday, as I said, for those of you who came late, on Monday, you uh, I'll do the class more like office hours. So just come if you want to ask me any specific questions. And I'll also give you uh, extra office hours on Monday, uh, Wednesday of next week. So I'll send you that information uh, on an announcement. But yeah, I think that's good for today because we're almost done out of time. So once I have the, the video from tomorrow, I'll just post it as an announcement if you want to watch it. But yeah, let's see.